On March 30th, 1776, a party led by Juan Batista de Anza reached the bay's entrance. What they're trying to do is look for places for missions and presidios, places to establish their outposts of Spanish civilization. And so they need a few things. They need to find timber, they need some construction materials, they need access to water, they need um, good grasslands and range territory. And so they're, they're always analyzing the landscape they're going through. The landscape they saw was far different from that of today and signifies the scope of change in the modern era. In 1776, the site that became San Francisco was a hilly, windswept peninsula of sand dunes and scrub with two notable wetlands on its eastern shore. The largest was a vast tidal lagoon that came to be called Mission Bay. Filled in piecemeal over the last 150 years, it is entirely gone. The second wetland lay a mile to the north at the site of today's financial district. The tidal flat that came to be called Yerba Buena Cove would eventually become the original site for the city of San Francisco. Shallow and easily filled, today it too has vanished beneath the urban landscape. In 1776, this was the original shoreline of San Francisco, and Father Pedro Font would have seen a flat, sandy beach cove. Today, of course, it's the financial district, and we're about six blocks away from San Francisco's existing shoreline. On horseback, the expedition moved south along the San Francisco Peninsula before circling around a great network of tidal marsh and mudflats at the bay's southern tip. We now have a pretty clean shoreline. We now think we know where the bay ends and where the waters begin. Back in those early days, you didn't have that. You had an indeterminate area. What that means is you had this tremendous variation in the extent of the bay. You can imagine if you were on a hill on a day with some fairly high tides, the size of the bay could double in six hours. Reaching what they deemed the Contra Costa, or opposite shore, the expedition quickly moved north along the bay's largely treeless eastern plain to arrive on the shores of San Pablo Bay. Here was yet another vast opening in the coastal range they named after the Carquine people who inhabited its shores and fished there, Carquinas Strait. Beyond the strait lay yet another expansive bay and an intricate, impassable network of channels and islands that blocked any further advance. They're trying to get a sense of what the delta is. If it's a river, if it's part of the bay, it's, it's a confusing feature. It's such a so vast, you can't get around it. We went up to the top of this hill, which overlooks the entire plain. And from there, we saw a confusion of water, tule marshes, a bit of woods near the mountains on the south, and an enormous stretch of flat land such that in my lifetime, I have not viewed so great an expansive horizon, nor do I expect to again. Looking eastward, we saw a large and very long snowy mountain range, white from crest to foot. The distant mountains font simply designated Sierra Nevada, snowy range. The puzzling confusion of waters below was, in fact, one of the great river deltas of the Americas, the confluence of the Sacramento and the San Joaquin rivers. It was California's Everglades in terms of its overall biological productivity, particularly in the upper portions of the estuary and the delta itself. This was 700,000 acres of tidal freshwater marsh, extraordinary organic productivity within it. This was the most productive ecosystem in the Western Americas.